Welcome, Erica. Thank you, Joe. Well, Erica, let's start from the beginning. How did Port Deposit get its name? Well, Port Deposit got its name because it had become a Port of Deposit. But uh, it had many names before it became Port Deposit. Uh, in uh, 1608, of course, Captain John Smith had come here. But we know as early as 1729 that Thomas Cressop had a ferry boat operating across the Susquehanna River between Cecil and Harford counties. And during that time, the ferry boat was named in honor of Captain John Smith as Smith's Ferry, and the town became known as that. Uh, years later, when a mill was put in operation, it became known as Rock Run for the Rock Run Mill. Uh, it wasn't until 1812-1813 when uh, Philip Thomas, who owned Mount Ararat Farm and basically all of the property on uh, the south side of Port Deposit, had the town laid out into lots by an eminent surveyor of the time, Hugh Beard, uh, that when that town plat went to the General Assembly, the governor looked at it and said, it's become a port of deposit, why not call it as such? I mean, port deposit we became. So this is port deposit. Why did goods come here in the first place? Well, they came here basically because of the river itself. Um, when you looked at the Susquehanna River today, you're going to see a lot of rocks in the river, but nothing like what it was uh, in the early days. Uh, you had a lot of rocks, you had rapids, you had waterfalls and goods could not come down the river and get beyond those areas. So what would happen is in the spring, people who were upriver in Pennsylvania and other states who wanted to bring their goods down river would wait until there was a spring freshet. We call them freshets here. A lot of places would call them floods. And because of that higher water, you could take a flat bottom vessel and get it down the river. It was still extremely dangerous and required a great deal of skill but you could get down the river and avoid the rocks and some of the rapids and carry goods down. Once you got down to Port Deposit, you could offload those goods, sell them, and transship them to other areas. Um, but once you got here, what did you do with your vessel? Well, you broke it apart, you sold off that lumber, and then you made um, a, a transaction for people to purchase arc sweeps to become irons or uh, the actual ores to, to be turned into uh, spindles and rails for, for houses. And we actually have arc lumber that's been made into uh, pews at, uh, for example, the Friends Meeting House in Kalora. So the goods came down here because of the flow of the river, and they stopped here because of the rocks in the river, and then they were transshipped on. These rocks are the same rocks that stopped Captain John Smith, aren't they? Correct. Um, you had rocks and rapids that stopped uh, Captain John Smith. As a matter of fact, on his uh, map that was subsequently published, um, he drew an X and marked it as Smith Fails. And of course, history has been very kind and called it Smith's Falls. Tell us something about the ships that came to Port Deposit. Okay, well, the vessels that came to Port Deposit um, were called arcs or rafts, and they were, they were really odd, curious structures. Um, the arcs were 75 feet long and 25 feet wide. They were flat bottomed. They'd have a small shack in the center of them for basically the protection and shelter of the, the men coming down river with goods. And they had basically one long, large sweep and an oar, and you kind of had to guide the vessel down. The, you, you certainly couldn't steer it, uh, but, you, but you tried to guide it as it came down. Um, and like I said, those would be broken apart once they got to Port Deposit and then sold off for the lumber they could bring. But they were loaded up with uh, everything from whiskey to rye to flour to barrel staves, uh, slate, anything that could be brought down river. As a matter of fact, the first one was constructed during 1796 by a German miller uh, who wanted to get his goods to market. He wanted his flour to market. So over the winter months, he built this thing, essentially, that didn't have a name at the time, brought it down the river during the spring freshet and made a good deal of money, walked back to Pennsylvania, and once people found out how good of a market he had received and how much money he made, they were sure to follow. You told me that chrome was brought down here from Rising Sun. Absolutely. Uh, there were chrome mines in Rising Sun in the Silmar area. It's kind of a lost name in the, in the Rising Sun area now, but uh, Chrome was found there and it was transshipped from Port Deposit aboard vessels to Europe where it was used in making paint that was again brought back to America where we were building and creating our towns and cities. When boats came down here from Pennsylvania, some of them didn't make it. Did this spur the building of the canal on this side? 
Well, the, the first arc that came down in 1796 actually came down because the upriver people were really sick of waiting for the canal. Uh, the first theories and mentions of a canal were 1783 with the Maryland General Assembly. And uh, it was supposed to be completed within 10 years. By 1795, it still wasn't done. So the following year is when you see the first arc coming down. Uh, in 1795, they had extended the deadline by 10 years. And it's believed around 1803, 1805 is when it was actually thrown up and for use. Now that canal was a swift water canal, but it was also not very wide and not very deep. So it went from Love Island to Pennsylvania and came down just above Port Deposit. So you could come down it, but you needed a very skilled pilot to get you down the river. That's where you have Pilot Town and Conowingo started for the men uh, of Irish descent who would bring the vessels down. Um, and it, it just didn't bring back the kind of uh, revenues that the original proprietors of the canal had hoped to receive, among them being Augustine Washington uh, and uh, Charles Carroll of Carrollton, signer of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, actually, in, by 1835, when there was talk of creating a canal on the Harford County side of the river, the proprietors of the Old Maryland Canal, or Conowingo Canal, it was also called Susquehanna Canal, were very eager to jump on board with that and offload their failing system. Uh, and, and become part of their company. Well, they tried to make that canal work, didn't they? They widened it. Yes, they, they widened it. Um, they attempted to make it not a swift water canal. Um, and, and you have to realize during the time when they were trying to build this, this was one of the first canals that was going uh, in the United States. And they had a lot of workers who were brought over or starting work um, who became ill during the construction of the canal and died. But you also had the same water woes that you would have any other time, flood, ice gorges. And you'd get the work done, winter would come, it would wreck your work, you'd start over again. So there was a lot of going back and repairing, and it just, it never got to where everybody had hoped that it would financially. When did Port Deposit become a town? Port Deposit became a town technically in 1812, 1813 when it was named, but it wasn't until 1825 that you see a town forming and 1827 when you see elections taking place. The town was granted a charter as Port Deposit at that time. Um, but really it was the canal, even though the canal didn't uh, create a lot of money for the proprietors, it created a lot of money for the merchants. So right after the canal start, you start seeing a lot of new businesses coming in and houses being built and that sort of thing. In the beginning, we had a few dozen houses, correct? And when Port Deposit was uh, initially laid out, there were about 12 houses here. And all of those houses catered to the canal and the ARC pilots, and the, or catered to the river and ARC pilots. Um, they would serve them food, serve them, serve them beverage, and give them an overnight place to stay before walking back up to Pennsylvania. And then as the canal came in, you started to see more businesses cropping up and warehouses and houses and people living here for longer periods of time and setting up residents. Around the Civil War, how big was Port Deposit? It might be hard to imagine, but in 1860, we were the eighth largest city in the state of Maryland. We had a 2, 000, over 2,000 inhabitants here in Port Deposit. We had 74 places of business. We had uh, physicians, we had uh, hat shops and a watchmaker and a jeweler and uh, four places where you could buy groceries. We had a justice of the peace, uh, but we didn't have any lawyer in 1860. <laughs> Around this time, the town was creating a millionaire of note. Tell me about him. Um, in 1810, Jacob Tome was born in York County, Pennsylvania. In 1830s, he came here to Port Deposit, poorly educated, without a lot of money. But he had a good wit, and he had good sense about him. Formed a partnership with a fellow named David C. Reinhardt out of Pennsylvania, who was a lumber merchant. And basically, Reinhardt put up $5,000, Jacob Tome put up his brain and his residency in the town. And before too long, they f had a company that was making well over the hundreds of thousands of dollars in the 1840s and 50s. Um, Jacob Tome then went into banking, into canals, into railroads. Uh, he was really quite a magnate in the, in, in the banking industry, forming Cecil National Bank, which was actually located in his home. Uh, which was the Hyatheum Mansion here in Port Deposit. But Jacob not only got into the lumber business, he owned the lands where the trees were cut down. He owned the boat that brought the lumber down. He owned the mill where the lumber was planed. And chances are he probably owned the city lot where the lumber was being used to build a house. So 
he was very diversified uh, to make his millions, and he became Cecil County's first millionaire. Who were some of the other leaders of Port Deposit? Oh, there were a great deal of, of Port Deposit leaders through the years. Uh, Jacob Toma probably is the most well-known because of uh, uh, Tome Highway and Tome's Landing Condominiums, Tome's Landing Marina, uh, as well as the Tome School. But uh, his in-law, John Andrew Jackson Cresswell, uh, was Postmaster General of the United States. He's the only Cecil County to have served on a presidential cabinet. Um, and if it weren't for him, the penny postcard would have never come into use in the United States. Uh, he served under Ulysses S. Grant and uh, was also credited with being one of the founders of the Republican Club or the Republican Party in uh, the state of Maryland. You also have people like his mother, Rebecca Cresswell, who uh, was quite wealthy and she owned basically the north side of town. When John became a, an attorney and she remarried, she basically had what we would now know as a prenuptial agreement drawn up so that she'd retain rights to her property and land. Uh, that home where John Andrew Jackson Cresswell was born is number one Center Street, which is now a bed and breakfast here in Port Deposit, and briefly had served as Dr. Richard's Hospital as well. But we also had people uh, like Cornelia Smith, who was a great philanthropist in the town in the early 1800s, his wife Hannah, uh, who was active in the Sunday School here. Cornelia Smith built, had built the uh, Battle Swamp Road during a time when a lot of men were uh, out of work in the town. But you had people also who passed through town who were quite famous. Uh, for example, at Bainbridge, you had everyone from Willard Scott to Tony Curtis, Bill Cosby to Hall of Famer Stan Musial. You had uh, Gene Tunney as athletic director, Connie Mack, who did recruiting and scouting. And you had people that attended Tome School for Boys, such as uh, John Knight, Pulitzer Prize winner. Um, and you also had people like Sarah Fernandez Collins, born in Port Deposit, who became uh, one of the greatest African-American social workers in Baltimore, as well as Elizabeth Foreman Lewis, a John Newberry award-winning author. So Port Deposits had its brushes with fame and with uh, leaders and movers and shakers. There's a lady from Port Deposit that wrote a book on granite, correct? Uh, oh, Nancy Roberts. Uh, Nancy Roberts was curator of the Paul Paul Museum. And uh, when she was in college doing a, a course, she started working on uh, the quarry and interviewing people who had worked on the quarry. Now, keep in mind, she was in college during her, her 70s and doing this project. <laughs> and uh, luckily, I, she had donated that research project to the Paul Paul Museum, and we came across it and uh, told her that we thought it would make a wonderful book. And she, she thought it might do a pretty good job as a book, and people might be interested in it. And uh, it was called, um, we called it Everlasting Granite, and by golly, it is, which was a quote from one of the people she interviewed, Dominic Cifaldo. Uh, who was pretty famous over in Perryville. He became the first person uh, elected into the Maryland Municipal League, Municipal League Hall of Fame. Speaking of leaders, tell me something about Snow's Battery. <laughs> uh, Snow's Battery B. Uh, first Maryland Light Artillery during the Civil War. These were men primarily from Port Deposit, but the 7th District of Cecil County, and some men from Harford County, or who settled, settled later in Harford County. They were led by Captain Alonzo Snow. And Snow had uh, worked on the canal as a, a supervisor. Eventually, the political intrigue got to him, and he got out of it and opened up an agricultural implement store on one of the wharves here in Port Deposit with Thomas I. Polson. Um, he had served in the regular army at Fort McHenry, and that's where he actually met his wife, Emmeline. When the shots were fired on Sumter, he quickly got together with other men from Port Deposit and formed the battery. Almost all of the officers were from Port Deposit, uh, Theodore Vanneman, Lucius Jerry. Um, Leonard Parker, and these men formed an artillery unit that went into battle. They were entrenched in northern Virginia for a great deal of the war, but uh, they were in the Seven Days Battles. They fought at Malvern Hill with great distinction, Antietam, Fredericksburg, um, and there, of course, is a, a, a book out about them called uh, A Snowball's Chance, and it features uh, 100 of their letters that had never before been published, which are part of the permanent collection of the Paw Paw Museum. What are some of the phases that the town has gone through over the years? Well, the phases, they, they overlap, of course, so much. Um, a lot of it is connected, of course, with transportation, as of, with so many other towns. Um, but you have sort of that discovery period of the 1608 with Captain John Smith, and then you go up into the transportation system with uh, Thomas Cressop, the rattlesnake colonel of uh, Old Town in Western Maryland. Um, and then you go on to the periods where you have the building phase of the arcs and the rafts coming down. 
on into really the founding and the formation of the town in 1812. Uh, but you, you continue on to have that, that growth period. The heyday, really, for Port Deposit was, was in the mid-1800s. That was when you had a lot of industry going on here. You still had some of that shipment going on. You had steamboats coming between Port Deposit and Baltimore and Habit of Grace and Lapidum. You had a lot of activity in that regard, a lot of businesses in the area. You had the fishing industry and, of course, ice houses. You had the granite quarries in full operation. You had um, shipping by via larger vessels that were coming up from Baltimore, shipping products from up north as well as products from here in Port Deposit and the farms that were operational in the area. So you had a lot of activity during that period. It really was sort of the heyday. And then as you progress forward from that after the Civil War, you start to see a bit of a decline because after the Civil War is when the railroads come through. And uh, with the railroads, you see the definite decline of river traffic up through 1927 with the Conowingo Dam, which shuts down river traffic entirely to Port Deposit, and it becomes more of a place for granite to be quarried and that sort of thing. And then after that period, you go into the Wiley manufacturing phase and Bainbridge, and then beyond that, you go into Port Deposit of its later years. Was there a bridge here uh, across the Susquehanna after the ferry boats left? After the ferries quit, there was a bridge here. There was a covered bridge, actually, that went uh, between Port Deposit and Lapidum, which is uh, in Susquehanna State Park uh, in Harford County. Uh, the bridge was quite a, a curious structure. Um, matter of fact, it, at New Year's, it was actually burned down when a drove of cattle, uh, or a, sec a span was actually uh, uh, broken off when a drove of cattle went across it, and it had been burned down when a sleigh was driven too quickly across it and caught, uh, caught a spark of one of the nails sticking out. Um, the well, bridge finally washed away in 1857, <laughs> however. Let's talk about the history of the town from the Tome School up through the Navy. Well, with the Tome School, uh, the Tome School was chartered in 1889 as the Jacob Tome Institute. Right. And it was founded on the largesse of Jacob Tome, Cecil County's first millionaire, and of course, Port Deposit's greatest philanthropist. Uh, and it was created as a school free to the children of Port Deposit, and it was thrown open in 1894. Um, now originally, when it was thrown open, they had planned for about 300 students. They actually had almost twice that many <laughs> when they opened the doors. Um, and the school continued to operate uh, even after Jacob Tome's death in 1898. And at that time, he left the school $3 million, which was a huge endowment for that time. The school board, realizing that they were a free school, knew that they would always be hitting that endowment. So they decided to erect a boarding school. And that boarding school was going to be on the hill above Port Deposit to be known as the Tome School for Boys. They actually opened it up to a competition for architects. And they brought in architects Boring and Tilton, who won the competition. Now, they're the same architects who did the main building of the Ellis Island Immigrant Station. Now, the supervisor for the overall project for building the Tone School for Boys was Frederick Law Olmsted, who, of course, designed uh, Central Park in New York City. So they spared no expense. They did wonderful grand buildings built of dress, port deposit, granite. Um, it really was quite a beautiful campus with Italian gardens and that Beaux-Arts style of architecture. Where does the Navy come into play then? Well, the Tome School continued in operations. Um, Jacob Tome Institute continued uh, operating as a free school downtown, and the Tome School for Boys continued in operations. Right up till 1938, you start seeing some serious problems with the school on the hill. Um, more money was going out than was coming in, as it were. Um, it was the stock market crash, bad investments. It was a lack of money coming in, and people weren't sending their sons to a boarding school. Uh, they simply couldn't afford it. So the school was, was slowly uh, losing money, and the goal of the school was to keep the town school free and open to the public. So uh, the board of directors tried to sell the, the campus. <clears throat> and they looked to a number of different uh, entities to buy it. And finally, uh, in 1941, they went to the, ar to the federal government. And uh, it was kind of that Army-Navy rivalry. They went to the Army and said the Navy was interested, and they went to the Navy and said the Army was interested, mm -hmm. and the Navy wrote the first check. They acquired the school, which was a, a, about a 100-acre campus, and then 74 properties surrounding it to create what would become Bainbridge Naval Training Center, 
because there was a crash wartime building boom on at the time for training uh, recruits. Hurricanes and flooding have been a big part of Port Deposit's history. Let's tell us about that. Well, we have a saying in Port Deposit, if you don't get to the river often enough, it'll come to you. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and <boy. laughs> indeed it has, <laughs> uh, on more than one occasion. The worst <clears throat> flood and ice gorge was in 1910. That was, that was just a terrible gorge, and it took days to clear the railroad tracks of ice, and they pulled the men out of the quarry to work with dynamite and picks to try and get rid of all the ice. But the, the ice gorges and the floods are, are, are part and parcel of the port deposit experience, as it were. Um, there used to be, uh, every winter, cartoons in the Baltimore Sun and the News American about port deposit awaiting its annual bath uh, for the floodwaters coming down the river. And yes, the, the town did get flooded, and yes, there were floodwaters. Um, and you would see the north side of town flood first, and then the water would slowly come up. And there's, there's a lot of stories about the different floods of uh, people moving from the riverside to the cliffside and staying with friends and eating them out of house and home. And then when the water got there, they'd move up the river or up the road further to the south side of town and even camp out on the hillsides. Um, but it was also a time where, uh, of renewal. People all band together and came together, and that, that goes right through to 96 when we had a high water event. It wasn't a flood, but high water event. And um, people came together and they fed their neighbors and welcomed them into their houses and, and took care of one another. Probably one of the most significant to recent memory would be 1972. And if you, if you lived in Port Deposit, it's Hurricane Agnes. If you don't live in Port Deposit, it's Tropical Storm Agnes. Um, but that was, that was a real doozy. That one brought a, it, it wasn't just the, uh, just the water that comes in, but the mud and the muck and the cleanup afterwards. And at that time, you had uh, Bainbridge sailors still here. They came down and helped clean out the town and throw out things from houses that had been ruined and, and uh, really helped out. But we have, we have quite a few stories of houses that have holes drilled in the floor to help the floodwaters recede and people moving pianos to the second story because the flood was coming. Let's talk about some of the industries that were here. Well, there were a number of industries in Port Deposit, everything from people vacationing coming from the cities to stay in hotels like the Washington Hotel or the Smith's Hotel, Falls Hotel. Um, we had the granite quarries where you had a number of men working, a lot of Irish and Italian laborers, very skilled stonecutters came and worked here. And they cut stone for everything from the St. Augustine Seawall to the base stone of the American Legion Monument in Florida to churches in Philadelphia, mansions up and down the East Coast, all five churches in Port Deposit or Port Deposit Granite. And you also have the entrance to the Lincoln Tunnel, New Jersey side, is Port Deposit Granite. You had, as I said before, fisheries here in Port Deposit. You had the BC Bib Stove Company and the Armstrong Stove Company, which were also tinware shops. Armstrong was kind of interesting because the Armstrong brothers came over from Ireland and they were gunsmiths originally, and stoves uh, became their, their great industry when here in Port Deposit. What about Wiley Manufacturing? Wiley Manufacturing in the uh, mid-1900s was a, a really big industry for Port Deposit. They did shift work. They hired a lot of people from Harford and Cecil Counties, welders uh, primarily. They made the Wiley Whirly cranes, and uh, they also made uh, ships, which uh, one of them was of the Miss Circle line, which went to the Statue of Liberty. Uh, and they also made something you might be familiar with, the Harbor Tunnel yeah, in uh, Baltimore. was uh, floated down from Port Deposit and set in place. One other industry was the railroad. Tell us about it. Well, the railroad had a significant impact on Port Deposit. Uh, one of the great stories of the railroad was when, uh, when Mr. Way had a station at the southern terminus of town. He called the town Bloomingdale because when the first train arrived, so many pretty girls arrived to, uh, to welcome him. But Port Deposit actually had three train stations. We had one which was known as the Tome Station, which was on the south side of town, one in the middle of town, and then we had one at the Rock Run side of town. Um, eventually, you would see the Tome Station used primarily for uh, your boys and girls going to the school, but also for Mr. Tome's personal use in the early years. Um, you had uh, the railroad basically cutting off the town, though, as it were. If you look at the town now, it runs along uh, Main Street, which is the north-south artery through town, and it cuts the river off from the people living along Main Street. And when the dam went in, the Conowingo Dam, 
the railroad tracks had to be elevated. So the extreme north side of town was also kind of left in, in, in a bit of a ditch uh, from the elevated railroad tracks, although the railroad company had wanted them to be much, much higher when they originally made the plans. What is happening now in Port Deposit? Well, Port Deposit today. has had such a resurgence. If you look at Port Deposit after 1972 with, with Hurricane Agnes, since we're in Port, I can say that, uh, you had the town listed on the National Register of, of Historic Places. You had uh, Grace Humphreys, who really uh, came forward and created the Port Deposit Heritage Corporation and started collecting items for the Paul Paul Museum, uh, and, and that being founded and um, just the items that have come into the museum and been preserved and the histories preserved has been outstanding. But as you move on through the years, you also see uh, the Tome School cleanup volunteers starting up at uh, the old Bainbridge site, the Bainbridge Redevelopment Project that's going on, uh, Tome's Landing Marina going in, and the Tome's Landing condominiums along the waterfront in Port Deposit instead of an industrial development being along the waterfront. Um, and you see a lot of houses that were once cut up into uh, multifamily units, apartments and boarding houses during the Navy years that are being restored back into single family homes and being very lovingly preserved and, and, and cared for and now thrown up in for candlelight tours that are held uh, the first Saturday of every December here in Port Deposit and people are coming from everywhere to go through these houses and go on the tour and um, enjoy concerts by Peabody students at our different churches during those tours and, and those sorts of things. So there's really a renewed sense of pride for Port Deposit that, that's come about and it's going to be very interesting to see how things, uh, things change and how this continues with the redevelopment of Bainbridge and how it affects Main Street. Bainbridge is now part of Port Deposit, is that correct? Yeah, uh, Bainbridge was annexed into Port Deposit in 1999 by an act of town council and um, now in its entirety, the former naval base is part of Port Deposit, including the historic district that is the Tome School for Boys historic site, as well as the Snow Hill area, which was a free black community prior to 1841. Port Deposit has a great future and a wonderful history. I want to thank you for being with us today, Erica. Thank you, Joe. It was my pleasure. We want to thank Erica Quisenberry for being our guest today, and a special thanks to you, our viewing audience, for being with us. We hope to see you again soon. Thank you, Joe. Nice to be here. Harlan, let's talk about the early history of the Tome School. Well, it goes back quite a few years, as you may have heard. Uh, Jacob Tome was the uh, visionary that ultimately created the Tome School. And he came into our area in Port Deposit, I think it was in 1833. Uh, quite a businessman, engaged in banking, railroading, steamboating, lumber business. And uh, by the late 1880s, uh, he had amassed quite a fortune. And he started a school in uh, Port Deposit, kind of a manual arts school, one for building for boys and one for girls, and, uh, and also a gymnasium. And then in 1899, based on the success of that program, uh, Mr. Tome acquired 100 acres up on the bluff overlooking Port Deposit, uh, known as the Abrams Farm, and uh, began the construction in the 1900s through 1910 of what is now the Tome School, with seven large granite buildings and uh, six uh, professor's quarters. We're going to show you some of the examples of the buildings there, and that campus was gorgeous. Oh yes, uh, and it has still a lot of potential. And that's what uh, we're going to talk about. <laughs> the buildings were designed uh, uh, primarily by uh, Bolton and Tilton, a uh, fairly well-known architectural. They won the uh, RFP in the language of today uh, to uh, provide the architectural structure for the buildings. And it's, uh, it's classified as uh, Beaux Art. Uh, Georgian Revival style, 
uh, all large granite buildings. And the other centerpiece of the building is the uh, Italian Gardens, uh, which was designed in the construction supervised by Frederick Olmsted, who uh, was well known for his work in uh, creating the Central Park in New York City. And I might add that the, um, the Bolton and Tillman organization also received international fame because of their, uh, the center they did, the Immigration Center at uh, Ellis Island in New York. Well, in 1942, the Navy came. Tell us about that. Well, it operated as a boys' school uh, up until 42. And uh, Jacob Tome, when he set up those buildings, and, and they were constructed from, as I said, 1900 to 1910, he provided an endowment of about $3 million to, to manage the operation uh, under the guidance of his wife and a board of trustees. And uh, by the early 40s, uh, the endowment was, um, I guess, pretty well used up. And uh, coincidentally, the Navy was looking for a mid-Atlantic East Coast operation for a training center. And they went to President Roosevelt, who had been Secretary of the Navy, and, and right. had made speeches, as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. at the Tome School. And I'm very familiar with the property. And he authorized the purchase of the Tome site, uh, approximately 100 acres again. And it was acquired in 1942 for $983,000 versus the initial construction cost of the buildings of a little over a million dollars. So over the 40 years, I think they did pretty well. So. What did the Navy use the school for? It was primarily a, um, a prep school. Right. Uh, frequently enlisted people and, and, uh, in the fleet would have been identified with some uh, leadership qualities. Right. Uh, but over time, their academic skills uh, had kind of diminished. So they would be sent to the prep school at the Tome School site. And if they completed their academics and mathematics skills, they would go on to Annapolis and be commissioned as an officer. While that was going on, the Navy acquired more land. What was it used for? So when they acquired the, the uh, property in 1942, as I said, that was the Abrams property, about 100 acres. They then proceeded to acquire about another 70 to 75 farms in the area and created uh, in total a 1,200 acre, approximately 1,200 acres, Naval Training Center with uh, four what were known as boot camps for enlisted people coming into the Navy, uh, plus a variety of training schools, specialty areas, that type of thing. And it operated in that capacity on and off until 1976. There was some shutdown time in there uh, when international affairs were not that pressing. But right. uh, basically in 1976, they left the property and locked it. And as the natives say, they threw away the key. And how many sailors were there in its heyday? Based on the literature I've seen, I think at capacity, there were about 55,000 individuals on that property, which, which kind of made it uh, the centerpiece of Cecil County at that time. And the base shut down. And then what happened? Well, over a period of time, the... Um, uh, Various commissions were formed and committees were formed to look at the property. The Navy still had ownership of it and right. come up with recommendations on uh, how it might be used. And uh, you may have heard or seen in the papers that uh, maybe a nuclear power plant would be suited there or the Baltimore Orioles were going to come there for a training camp or Walt Disney was coming there. Uh, all those committees, um, while they made a tremendous amount of effort, they weren't empowered to implement. And I guess out of frustration because the property had been idle for so long, uh, our delegation uh, had uh, a law created, uh, which, which created ultimately the Bainbridge Development Corporation in 1999, and it was made up of volunteers from the county, uh, nine individuals, and uh, their mission was to acquire the property from the Navy, uh, develop a uh, reuse plan, and implement it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where we are today. In other words, get the property back on the tax rolls. That's, that's the primary mission of the Bainbridge Development Corporation, is to create new wealth for the residents and citizens of, of Maryland. Well, Harlan, what is your role in the Bainbridge Development Corporation? Yeah, my role currently is chairman. Uh, our uh, <clears throat> uh, corporation was formed in, uh, by law in June of 99. I think our first meeting, uh, getting the directors together, was in October. And our first mission was to uh, negotiate with the Navy and acquire the property which we did in February of 2002. Our board is made up of nine uh, um, individuals, uh, all volunteers, and uh, the only exception to that is the position of economic development director in Cecil County is always a member of the board, a voting member of the board uh, by title. From 1976 to 1999, what happened? Uh, for the bulk of that period, the, the base was empty, and um, 
kind of a playground, I guess, uh, for anyone that, that was interested in that and traveling through the buildings and that type of thing. And as you might imagine, over time, there was a quite a bit of vandalism and some theft of, right. particularly in the tome area, right. of artifacts and relics and that type of thing. Uh, and then in the 80s, I guess, uh, agreement was reached with the Navy that the Job Corps would operate out of there, and they would use the tome buildings as um, dormitories, and also uh, they had a, uh, one of the boot camps was converted into a training center where they would do uh, <clears throat> learn manual arts uh, training. And they were there maybe for five or six years. And the vandalism increased? Well, uh, that's, that's the general consensus that uh, it created more uh, difficulties in, in, um, in getting the property ready for reuse. Uh, a lot of fires were set on the bases. As you'll see in some of the pictures, one of right. the buildings was, was gutted by fire, and that's been attributed to uh, the children or the boys in that organization, yes. From 1976 to 1999, we had vandalism, but the Navy did what in that time frame? Yes, they removed uh, the bulk of the buildings that uh, they had built when the property was in use by the Navy, and uh, they tore down some 550 buildings. Uh, <clears throat> and by the time we uh, were organized and, and uh, negotiating with the Navy, uh, EPA and MDE had uh, declared that the property was satisfactory for residential development. Let's go back to the Tome School. What are we looking at here? Yes, what we're looking at here is an aerial view of the Tome site. As you can see, the Susquehanna River in the background and the large building at the top left is Memorial Hall. Uh, that's the largest building on the property. It's the building that you can see the clock tower when you uh, drive north on I-95. And this represents a, uh, a, a blueprint, if you would, of the uh, actual building sites. You'll see the seven large granite buildings built around the quadrangle and the Italian gardens. And then at the lower part of the, the uh, property were the six professors' quarters. Uh, those are wooden frame houses, and they're still there today. And all of those buildings, by the way, now are part of Maryland Historical Trust, and our mission is to have those restored uh, as much as possible. Uh, this is particular shot is the uh, President's or Headmaster's House. Uh, that was the second building that was uh, built on the property. It's about 11,000 square feet, three stories high. Uh, the front and the back are identical in terms of the um, column uh, views that we see here. And then on the far right is the um, servants' quarters. Uh, which had the best view, I think, of anyone in Cecil County up and down the Susquehanna River at that time. So. Sadly, this is what uh, the headmaster's house looks like today. We're looking at the front entrance, uh, a lot of vegetation growth, although efforts have been made over time to keep that cleared. Uh, the columns uh, there are beginning to show some uh, degree of deterioration, and uh, actually one of the columns has been removed, and we've had to put a temporary prop in there. And one of your efforts is to repair the roof. Is that correct? Yes. yes currently, uh, we have a contract which was executed in October of uh, last year. And the purpose of that contract is to stabilize the seven granite buildings um, to prevent uh, <clears throat> any additional deterioration due to weather, uh, secure the buildings, and, and do what we call a, a broom clean on the inside. Uh, this Welcome to the Aberdeen Heritage Trust Series, Historic Harper. I'm Joe Swisher, your host. Today our guest is Erica Quisenberry, who's going to talk to us about the Bainbridge Naval Training Center located near Port Deposit in Cecil County. Welcome, Erica. Thank you, Joe. Well, Erica, let's start at the beginning. When did the Bainbridge Naval Training Center get started and how? Well, to understand uh, how Bainbridge got started and why it got started where it did, you really need to look beyond World War II and go back to really the turn of the century uh, when Jacob Tome, Cecil County's first millionaire who made his fortune in Port Deposit, chartered the Tome School, which was the Jacob Tome Institute in 1889, founded it in 1894 as a free school in Port Deposit on Main Street. When he died in 1898, he left what was essentially a $3 million endowment and the school board of trustees, realizing they wouldn't have income other than the endowment, uh, decided to build a boarding school on the hill above Port Deposit for uh, the, the elite boys of the day. They built that school for about a million dollars, and the school operated 
uh, for several years, but when you get to the period of the depression and the stock market crash, people aren't sending their sons away to a school that costs $1,200 a year at that point. So the school starts to go into decline. When that happened, the school started looking around for ways to offload the campus and still maintain the school downtown, which was by the original charter. And it was kind of a stroke of uh, marketing genius, if you will. The school went to the Navy and said the Army was buying, and they went to the Army and said the Navy was buying, using that old Army-Navy rivalry, and the Navy wrote the first check. Now, I believe that the Navy got that first check out because of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was very familiar with the campus. In 1927, he had been a guest speaker at the Tome School for Boys. He knew the campus, he knew how beautiful it was, this 100 acres, and he actually wrote from the Oval Office, Tome School sounds good, get it for less than a million, forget about Tahoe. So had it not been for his visit to Tome School in 1927, you may have been interviewing someone in Tahoe about Bainbridge. What did they intend to use the uh, Tome School for? Well, originally the Tome School was to be used for officers' candidate training prior to going into the Naval Academy. Uh, you would go through there and, and kind of beef up on your skills, on your academia, as it were. And then, of course, when we enter into World War II, we start needing extensive training for troops. So that's when you see the expansion from that 100-acre campus to acquiring 72 properties around the, the, the school proper and creating Bainbridge Naval Training Center. In other words, in 1940, it started as a prep school and then evolved into the Naval Training Center. Is that correct? Absolutely. Um, it, it evolved into that, uh, of course, acquiring the 72 farms and becoming almost 1,200 acres. How did we get the name Bainbridge? Well, Bainbridge did not exist as a name in Cecil County or Port Deposit prior to the creation of USNTC Bainbridge. And it was named for Commodore William Bainbridge, uh, who was born in Princeton, New Jersey in 1774, became a lieutenant in the United States Navy in 1798. Uh, of course, he fought in the uh, Tripolitan Wars, was commander of the Philadelphia, which ran aground. He was imprisoned for a year and a half, escaped uh, by burning the Philadelphia, uh, comes back to the United States and was actually sent in 1803 over to Cecil Furnace, which is about five miles from the Navy base that would be named for him 140 years later. He tested cannon there. And then during the War of 1812, he was in command of the Constitution, which of course took out the Java much better manned and uh, faster ship uh, and, and earned high accolades in the Navy for doing so. In 1942, we started building Bainbridge. Tell me what happened. Well, in 1942, you see the effort to really get Bainbridge going. We go into what is a crash wartime building boom. Uh, in that time period, I think it's fascinating to realize in March of 1942, you had this acquisition of all of this land, and you have the Tompkins Company from Washington, D.C., who sends their men to the area, 15,000 men to build Bainbridge. And by August of 1942, and new math or old math, that's six months, by August of 1942, you have 506 buildings on Bainbridge. It's an amazing building schedule. And we're not talking about uh, simple shake and bake buildings. We're talking about everything from your drill halls, your uh, chow halls, your barracks, your ship's company stores, your chapel. Uh, even your thunder boxes, which were your outdoor latrines, your, your, uh, your clothing lines, everything was built, and they created a city up on the hill in six months. The real heart of Bainbridge were the regimental halls? Yes, absolutely. You, you had uh, regimental halls uh, that went with each camp, and like Bainbridge being named for a naval hero, each camp itself was named for Navy heroes. You had uh, Camp James Rogers and Camp Perry. You had Camp Sims, which was a planned camp in the 5th Regiment area, which became the hospital group, uh, and uh, Camp Barney. And all of these, of course, named for Navy heroes that were connected within the area of Maryland. And these camps really, if you went into one for your 11 weeks of basic training, you really had no reason to go anywhere else on base. You would have uh, your supplies there, you would have your barracks, your huge drill field that the, the sailors always called the grinder because it was a grind going out there and learning your drills and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, and they were very much self-contained. And these, these drill halls, uh, 
were just massive Quonset huts that had uh, you know, your basketball courts and bleachers and they would have indoor swimming pools in them. They would have prize fights in them that were televised. Uh, that was in the, in the 1940s. They were just absolutely massive facilities. And if you see Bainbridge from the air in, in photographs, you can really tell just the scope of these, these grinders and the drill halls and the barracks that were beside them. It, it was really just an awesome feat. How many sailors would be in a regimental area? Well, in a regimental area, you would, you would take in between 500 to 1,000 sailors every week for training, and they would go into individual regimental areas. In the barracks, you would have uh, 120 sailors that were bunking on uh, one level, and then the next bunk up, you'd have 120, and then you'd have a two-floor barracks, of course. Uh, so you're talking about I, I find it fascinating that you're not only talking about training these fellows, you're talking about feeding a thousand guys coming through a chow hall and a chow hall line at a clip. And, and, and you can look at the, the pictures back in, in those days of these long lines of guys outside of the chow halls uh, waiting to get in um, because there were just so many men, especially during the 40s when, when we were training them in 11 <coughs> week periods and getting them out as quickly as we could. I was told each regimental hall would have about 5,000 sailors. Yes, what they would do is they would bring the, the troops in, in in weekly runs. So if you're talking about a 500 to 1,000 coming in for the first week, two weeks later you'd have another 500,000 and each one's on an 11-week hitch for training. So you can go up to the 20,000 of men just based upon the 11-week cycle for training. What was the peak employment of sailors and civilians at Bainbridge? Well, you had a, a, over the course of Bainbridge history, you had over a half million people that were coming through Bainbridge um, as sailors. Um, but in peak capacity, you were looking at 50 to 60,000 people at different periods in time in history. We had great roads at Bainbridge, didn't we? We had fabulous roads at Bainbridge, and actually they're pretty good today, even, even uh, 40 years later. But you had uh, uh, 44 miles of road that went uh, through Bainbridge, and then the sidewalks that go with all of that. And you have to realize you have Bainbridge Boulevard, which went through Bainbridge from Main Gate to the Back Gate, uh, there being 16 gates around the property. But this was, you know, just imagine if you will, now this is a Navy base, you have a four-lane highway with a divided median going all the way through Bainbridge with sidewalks on either side and plantings going down it and of course the, the tributary roads that go off of it. So I mean, it, it, was, it was an amazing undertaking to have such a, a, a large facility, a large road going through this area. One of the things that interested me was the ship they built on base. The, the ship, um, you know, when, if you're not familiar with Bainbridge or Port Deposit area, Bainbridge sits on a bluff above the town of Port Deposit. Port Deposit is on the waterfront of the Susquehanna River. Bainbridge, about 200 to 300 feet up from the town, so it is not waterfront property. So in order to train sailors, one must needs a ship, and the ship was actually built on dry land at Bainbridge. Uh, it was called the Commodore, which was, which was lovely. Um, but if you were a sailor, chances are you knew it as the USS Never Sail. Uh, one of the most interesting things I've heard recently actually came from a family member, my father, who went to Bel Air High School. And uh, when he was in grade school in Bel Air, they actually did a tour of the Never Sail. And he was very excited about having had an opportunity to be on, on that vessel. When I showed him pictures later, he said, I'm absolutely certain it was much bigger than that. <laughs> <laughs> Boot camp was 11 weeks. Could you describe what was going on? Uh, lots of letters home. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, if you look at the postcards and letters that, uh, that fellows sent and have subsequently been uh, donated to uh, the Bainbridge Historical Museum in Port Deposit, they, the fellows write an awful lot about first we drill and, and then we drill and then we eat and then we drill some more. So there was a lot of drilling, learning maneuvers. There was also a lot of, uh, once you would go through, you would get your, your uniform, you'd be measured, you'd go through all your psychological and physical exams. Uh, once you go through all of that, then you'd take your uniform back and you'd start to stencil it. Everything had to have your name on it. And then you'd go through finding your bunk, keeping your locker, learning Navy drill and Navy customs. Um, you would go into testing to find out what specialties that you might be good for in your service in the Navy. Um, you would have 
lovely little duties assigned to you, like guarding of the dumpsters, guarding of the uh, clotheslines. A lot of the fellows write about those guarding moments. Um, and then, of course, you would have every once in a while some chance for, for a little free time, and you might go to the post office to mail letters or go to the library that was on base or the riding stables or any of those other uh, opportunities that you had. Come graduation, what happened? On graduation, uh, you would have a, a drill and review on the drill field unless the weather was inclement, and then, of course, it would move into the drill hall and you would have a massing of the colors and the drum and bugle corps. You would go through uh, your maneuvers on a parade grounds. Uh, it was a, a sea of dress whites and you would be in front of the dignitaries of the base uh, to, to march in procession and then they would set up a set of bleachers uh, for a company or regimental photograph. Um, and Those are really prized possessions now to have this, these regimental photos. Um, and then it was off to your billet or your duty station. And parents could come, is that correct? Parents came. Um, and during a lot of the classes, you saw local dignitaries, local government officials that were coming. Um, you would even see school classes take class trips up there just to, to witness this kind of pomp and circumstance. With all the sailors coming to post, how did they get there? Well, they got there in a number of ways. The most common was by rail. Uh, you would come in through Aiken, which is, uh, was a little village between Parryville and Port Deposit. Uh, and then you would be transported from there by the Bainbridge Bus Company. Right. Um, and the Bainbridge Bus, I always find it kind of interesting because Bainbridge got its start because of the uh, Tome School campus that was there. The Bainbridge Bus, which took the sailors, was actually housed for a time in Jacob Tome's carriage house, which was for his horses and carriages, and then became a taxi and bus company. So, so the fellows usually came in in the bus and they would go past the uh, guard shack where they were told to dim their headlights before they passed and then they would go right into the in-processing center. So they got there by train, bus? And no plane. And no plane. Besides the recruit, recruiting and training of new recruits, what else was at Bainbridge? Over the life of Bainbridge, you had a number of different activities that came on. Of course, we've discussed the Naval Academy Preparatory School, which he was held at Tome School. But you also had uh, Yeoman School, which was training for administrative skills and duties. You had Radioman's A, B, and eventually a C School, which of course is training in uh, communications. You had a personnel men's school recruit training. They trained the recruiters to recruit more to come through Bainbridge. Uh, you had a dental school, hospital school, and then after the first caretaker status after World War II, you see the base come back to life during Korean War. And from 1959 to 1963, you see other activities come on that uh, included the Nuclear Power School, um, Firefighters Training School, and then you have uh, Eptoconus, Pamiconus, which were Personnel Accounting Maintenance Division and um, enlisted personnel for the continental United States. So at Bainbridge, you had the accounting for all of the uh, pay that would go out to naval personnel in the continental United States. Then you also had the records keeping for anyone who was stationed in the United States and the Naval uh, Manpower Reserve, which was the records for all reserve and retired personnel. And that unit alone carried 600,000 individual files on personnel that were all housed at Bainbridge. Tell me what the sailors would do on the Susquehanna River and in port deposit. So you can't have a sailor without water somewhere. You're right. And of course you have the Susquehanna River. So during the 1940s you had the sailors going down the hillside, down these steps into port deposit in 200 to 300 foot cliff, crossing Main Street and going out to a boat dock. Now the boat dock went uh, the entire distance of South Main Street's Marina Park on the waterfront and they would take whale boats out and they would do um, drills out on the Susquehanna River, abandoned ships drills and ship drills under oar. And uh, they would take these vessels out and then bring them back to the boat dock. And after going through all these maneuvers, and, and these whale boats were pretty large, then they'd have to hoof it back up the hill to get to, to their barracks and, and uh, recuperate, I'd imagine. Uh, but they had boat docks down on, um, on the waterfront in Port Deposit. And recently the town has restored the old jetty or attenuator that was uh, in Port Deposit that was part of the Navy boat experience. So if you go to Port Deposit, you can see some of the remnants. You can see some remnants. You can see the jetty and you can see uh, the davits that were up that would hold a whale boat. 
Uh, and uh, in the Veterans Plaza that's being built, there'll be a kiosk that has pictures of, of that time period in our history. This was a complete city. Let's review what was there. Well, you had support items that weren't just uh, for operations. You had support items that were just purely for fun and entertainment. Uh, Bainbridge was well known uh, as a base within the, the Navy community for having a lot of open space and picnic areas and, and wooded acreage. But it also had a riding stable and you could go out and ride some of that acreage and really enjoy the, the atmosphere of Bainbridge. You had a 26-lane bowling alley that you could enjoy if you were of the pins. You could enjoy the rifle range, whether it was for training or just for, uh, for an interest in shooting. Um, they had Camp Cares, which was a camp for Baltimore City youth to come up and enjoy. They had swimming pools, both indoor and outdoor. You could use the drill halls for basketball, volleyball. Uh, tennis courts were very popular, especially during the uh, late 1960s and early 1970s, a nine-hole golf course that was backed by the uh, Tome School area. Uh, they showed movies uh, seven days a week at Bainbridge during the 1960s. Uh, it had been four days a week prior to that. And then, of course, if you were looking for other enjoyments, you could go to the OM and the EM and the AC Ducey Club, and these were all the, the officers' clubs and bars and enlisted men's mess that you could go to where they had uh, games rooms, but they also had uh, facilities that you could rent out for like the Navy's wives clubs would have meetings there and that sort of thing. Uh, packaged goods stores were also located there. The officers club was in the old Tome School. Where was that? That was in Monroe Hall. So you had uh, Monroe Hall and it had the O room next door which could be rented out for, for clubs and different meetings and that sort of thing. Tell me about the amphitheater. The amphitheater was really a, an amazing facility. Um, it was kind of Quonset hut in, in shape, and you would have uh, 5,000 on up to 15,000 people sitting in this kind of uh, con cave uh, hillside where there were benches built into the hillside, keeping with the topography of the area. Of course, beneath these benches built into the hillside, which were backless benches, they were more like bleachers, you had all the benches with, with backs to them, and those, of course, were for officers. Right. Uh, <laughs> but probably one of the most popular events uh, was the Easter sunrise services, which continued to be held even as Bainbridge was, was sort of waning away. Uh, the churches from Cecil County would hold these massive sunrise services. But you also had uh, wonderful performers up there from uh, the Andrews sisters and Bob Hope and Jack Benny performing there. Uh, just to, to imagine sitting in that amphitheater and, and seeing the likes of, of Bob Hope performing or laughing at, with Jack Benny or, or just the harmonies of the Andrews sisters, it had to be a wonderful experience. And Count Basie. And Count Basie performed. Uh, he also performed in the Officers Club, which was at Monroe Hall. So he did a more intimate setting as well as that large amphitheater setting. Well, sports were big at Bainbridge, weren't they? Sports were really huge, and, and that really started in, in 1940s, really around 1943, when uh, an athletic director was brought on to Bainbridge. His name was Gene Tunney. Uh, he may be familiar to you as a, a championship boxer, and he was mm -hmm. brought in to do uh, physical activities training, fit to train uh, future physical instructors for the Navy. And during his tenure there, you see a lot of prize boxing matches, you see a lot of golf going on in tournaments and that sort of thing. But Bainbridge also attracted some, some serious greats. Connie Mack, who was the grandfather of baseball, did some recruiting up there. Uh, Stan Musial was a recruit who went through Bainbridge. Uh, there's actually a picture of him uh, cleaning windows at Bainbridge. Right. Um, and he was a baseball Hall of Famer. And uh, Charlie Choo Choo Justice, who, uh, if you if you like Tar Heel football, you better know the name Charlie Choo Choo Justice. He was at Bainbridge, and uh, there's really quite a few pictures of him uh, at Bainbridge in his Commodore's uniform playing the game. There were some other notable people that went through Bainbridge, weren't there? There were some notable people that didn't don the sports uniform or weren't noted for their sports activities. Probably uh, uh, the one I'll start with is, is Willard Scott. Uh, if you're a, a fan of morning news programs, and mm -hmm. he's, a, he's a weatherman and he's, he's never met an octogenarian he didn't want to celebrate their birthday with. Uh, 
Bernard Schwartzman might not be a familiar name to you, but his name is Tony Curtis, as an actor might be. In 1943, he went through Bainbridge. Uh, of course, a famous actor and, and painter now. Um, Bill Cosby is another actor who went through Bainbridge. And in his um, second television program that he did, he actually does a dream sequence where he's going into the Navy. And during the dream, there's this sign up that says, Welcome aboard NTC Bainbridge. So he remembered Bainbridge just as well as we remember him being at Bainbridge. And Yogi Bear was there, wasn't he? Yogi Bear was up at Bainbridge. Um, for a brief period of time, um, and you also had uh, some other people who went through Bainbridge, but we can't get, quite get the confirmation of when they were there. When did the post finally close? Well, the post went through um, periods of, of caretaker status or mothballing after World War II, after the Korean War, and it comes back in on the Vietnam War, but you start hearing the first rumblings in 72 and 73 that the post will be closing, and it's finally in 1976 that the gates are locked, the flag is brought down, and it's the final ceremony. The um, base, instead of going into mothball status at that time, this was really the swan song, and it was known to be the last days for the Navy being there. So the federal government used it for the Federal Job Corps program to, to train youth from uh, different cities throughout the area for uh, vocational education. Um, after it went from the Job Corps period, it went back into a period of, of basic abandonment. Uh, and then Navy came back and did some environmental cleanup work on the property, but they retained ownership of the property until uh, February 14th of 2000. So it really was in ownership of the federal government during that time, although there were no operations there except for cleanup projects. What happened on February the 14th, 2000? On February 14, 2000, the property was officially turned over by the federal government to the state of Maryland and their agents, the Bainbridge Development Corporation, uh, to redevelop the property into uh, a commercial use, into a viable use, a mixed-use development within the community. Um, during that time period, the town of Port, Port Deposit annexed the property into their town limits, which uh, more than probably quadrupled the size of the town right. at the time. And since that time, the Bainbridge Development Corporation has worked with Paul Risk Associates to restore the Tome School for Boys site. They're on stabilization efforts now. And the rest of the property is under a, a plan for a high-end mixed-use development that'll see new buildings and new life coming back to Bainbridge. Well, what really happened was everything that was Navy up there was torn down. Is that correct? Yeah, during the 1980s and, and really 1978 is when you see the first uh, bulldozer come through and start taking things down. Any Navy building, keep in mind they were built as temporary structures during the period when asbestos was king. Right. Uh, those buildings were torn down and if you were to go down Jacob Tome Highway towards the town of Port Deposit, you would see a hillside. And that hillside is actually a valley that houses the remains of all of the Tome School buildings. So when I take veteran sailors up there, uh, and they want to see their barracks. That's where I take them, because that's where they are now. There are still uh, a few buildings left. Hunter Hall, which was a waves building, is still in existence uh, on Bainbridge, that one uh, being built in, in 1968. Um, so there are a few buildings that still exist, but the majority of those 506 that were originally built right down to the glorious amphitheater uh, are no more. The name Bainbridge lives on. How is that? The name Bainbridge lives on uh, and has lived on for a number of years after Commodore William Bainbridge in ships that the Navy built. You know, Bainbridge was uh, really quite a Navy hero and they honored him. The first Bainbridge was a ship under sail built in 1842 and it lasted until the middle of the Civil War in 1863. It was used as a blockade ship. Uh, then you see the next ship that lasts until 1919. Uh, the following year, another Bainbridge is built, and that one is in 1920, and it lasts until 1945. Um, then you have the nuclear-powered Bainbridge that comes into existence. And in 1964, that vessel made a trip around the world in two months' time, never stopping for resupplies uh, during that entire journey. And then the last Bainbridge ship, um, was christened on November 5 of 2006, and of course it still bears the name Bainbridge within the United States Navy today. Well, Erica, the post lives on in other ways. 
Well, the post lives on, uh, obviously, through the memories of the veterans and sailors and civilians who worked there, but also through the efforts of uh, the USNTC Bainbridge Historical Association, which has come together in, in Port Deposit that has a museum operating with memorabilia and items, uh, stories, pictures, uniforms uh, that date to Bainbridge, sharing that story with people. They're open on uh, Saturdays and Sundays from, from 1 to 5. Um, they also live on through reunions and tours of the base. Um, the first reunion was held in 1999 with bus tours of, of Bainbridge and bringing back uh, about 400 people to come and see the base and share pictures and have lunch on the quad up there and listen to the Army Band perform. It was really uh, quite a wonderful uh, event to see that and, and to see all of the coming together and the sharing of the stories. And uh, you also see Bainbridge kind of reborn through the works that, that are being done by the Bainbridge Development Corporation by sharing the story with others with their information boards about the history of Bainbridge. What year did the waves come to Bainbridge? Uh, the waves, which were the women accepted for service in the Navy, came to Bainbridge in 1951 um, from Illinois, from Great Lakes, and in 1962 you see that becoming its own separate command at Bainbridge. And of course in 1968 you have Hunter Hall built at Bainbridge to house the, the waves. And they were there until uh, the base closed? They were there until just before the base closed. What is in store for the post now? Well, already we're aware of uh, Cecil Community College going in with a partnership with University of Maryland, Baltimore County, mm -hmm. uh, Cecil County Public Library being located there in a new facility to be built, and also the Bainbridge Historical Museum that's currently in Port Deposit uh, along the waterfront, um, putting that on the base in a location up there, and there's even been talks of a, of a veteran cemetery locating near that museum facility. Erica, I want to thank you very much for being our guest today and describing the rise and fall of the Bainbridge Naval Training Center. And we hope it has a wonderful future in the redevelopment. Absolutely. Thank you, Joe.